Bitcoin's third halving, uh, or my webinar about Bitcoin's third halving. Um, my name is Pierre Rochard. We're going to take a substantive tour of Bitcoin because I don't think it's possible to uh, fully understand or internalize the importance of this event uh, without some background. And uh, this is an introduction, so I don't assume any prior knowledge uh, about Bitcoin. So first, I, I guess, uh, you know, I should ask myself whether I should cancel this webinar. Uh, apparently, uh, coronavirus has become more popular than the Bitcoin having, uh, which is sad for humanity um, and uh, sad for this webinar. I feel like we're getting overshadowed, uh, but, you know, we're all remote tuning in over the Internet. So it, it is uh, safe to, to go forward with the webinar and uh, hopefully it'll uh, still be relevant going forward. In any case, we're going to start with an explanation of how the Bitcoin system works. And as we go along, I'll be highlighting some of the interesting properties that uh, this system has. At the most granular level, the Bitcoin software is leveraging cryptographic primitives to enable inter user interaction with the system. Uh, the Bitcoin system relies on keys hash functions, and digital signatures. Note that encryption is not used by the Bitcoin system. Uh, it's a completely transparent system. Uh, perhaps encryption will be used in the future, uh, but currently uh, there's no uh, encryption used. As a Bitcoin user, the first cryptographic primitive you're likely to encounter is keys. So uh, you've probably um, already used passwords, I would think. Uh, password is basically a private key, uh, except that it's human generated and human readable, unless you have a password manager. Now it's, it's much more common for people to uh, let their password manager generate a secure password uh, that's unique to every website they use. Um, back in the old days, we, we had to, uh, you know, manually come up with a password for each website, which obviously was very error prone. Uh, a password or private key is a secret, so never share it with others, especially if they ask you to. Um, and, you know, humans have trouble generating passwords using just our minds uh, because we're, we're not good at coming up with random numbers and letters. Uh, and especially if, it, you know, we want to have a long series of random numbers and letters. Uh, so we have to rely on external help. Physically, you can do it with dice or cards uh, that'll provide what cryptographers call entropy, or I think uh, physicists call it that as well, uh, which is basically just randomness. Um, computers have random, random number generators in them, uh, so we can leverage that uh, and kind of automate the process of creating a key. Um, so ultimately, your Bitcoin are secured by the privacy of your private key. And if someone else has this secret, they can take your Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is a public system. It is open source. It's fully transparent. So the enemy knows the system. Adversaries have access to everything except your secret private keys. Uh, so you'll often hear this maxim, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Uh, this is a reminder that using third parties to store your Bitcoins is actually holding a Bitcoin denominated claim on the third party. You aren't holding Bitcoins. You're not even really using the Bitcoin system except through a proxy. Uh, they are. So how do we securely generate and store private keys? This is uh, where it gets really interesting is that um, you know what you want to do when you're securing and generating private keys is that you want to enable seizure resistance so you want to increase the cost for the enemy to seize your bitcoins uh, now the, the enemy you know that's it, it could be anyone really um, and it's it's just about trying to uh, make it as hard as possible for them so Private keys are resistant to seizure, but they're not seizure-proof. Um, there's always a uh, 
you know, a way for an adversary to break the system if they have enough resources available to them. Uh, but that's a really important if there. And you can actually make the amount of resources necessary so great that in practice, you're never going to get your private keys hacked. Uh, and you've got to worry about other uh, ways of uh, being attacked instead. So improperly secured private keys are vulnerable uh, to inside jobs. Um, for example, maybe you have an employee that you shouldn't necessarily trust um, or outside hackers as well. Uh, for the most part, Bitcoin users have succeeded in keeping the cost of seizure greater than the value of their private keys. Uh, there are some notable exceptions, uh, some big slip ups if you uh, read about the history of Bitcoin, but for the most part, uh, Bitcoin users have been pretty good about keeping their private keys secure. A strong option for um, doing this yourself is called multi-sig. So this is where uh, you have multiple private keys that need to be combined. Um, and this enables redundancy and security so that all your Bitcoin are not on one device. Uh, instead, it takes a combination of devices or um, uh, sources to be able to unlock the Bitcoin. Uh, so these devices are called hardware wallets. Uh, um, we got a Trezor here, a Ledger, a cold card. Um, and these are, you know, they come from different manufacturers. So you can actually combine these in a multi-sig. Uh, if you don't trust any single manufacturer, uh, now you have a much more secure setup um, if, if you use all three in combination. But um, Whenever you're trying to increase the cost for adversaries, uh, usually you're also increasing the complexity for yourself. Uh, so there's trade-offs there between uh, usability and security as well. So confiscation can come from a natural disaster. Uh, the steel plate at the bottom right there is used to prevent fire or floods from destroying the private key. Um, and so you can, you can actually back up your hardware wallet using uh, a steel plate like this so that you can have uh, additional um, assurances with regards to the security of the private key against the elements. Now, uh, the risk of confiscation does not just come from criminals or nature. Unfortunately, there are governments around the world that do take private property without due process. Uh, the United States is not immune from this. Unfortunately, uh, law enforcement agencies have frequently found to be using civil asset forfeiture to take and sell private property without convicting or charging the property owner with a crime. Uh, there are uh, you know, government uh, legislative efforts to curtail this abuse of power, uh, but in the meantime, uh, with Bitcoin, you can combine a private key stored on a physical device with a passphrase in your brain, and you can plead the fifth uh, to not give the password, even if the government seizes the device. And uh, historically, this has held up in court. So you can essentially secure your Bitcoin with your mind, and uh, that will allow you to uh, not have them seized by uh, civil asset forfeiture in the United States. Um, so you take the private key, you multiply it uh, using elliptic curve cryptography. Um, so the thing about elliptic curve cryptography is that you, you can do the multiplication, but the division is so computationally intensive that it is economically impossible for the foreseeable future. Uh, so uh, this makes sure that you can't calculate the private key uh, if you have the public key. So as its name implies, uh, the public key is something that you can share with others. And um, each private key has one public key. And in Bitcoin, you actually, you share a public key, uh, but you share it um, after it's been hashed. So let's talk about what, what being hashed means. So a hash function, um, well, so on the elliptic curve cryptography, the, the public key result is the same length as the private key that you put in. And uh, that, that can be pretty long. So with a hash function, what you do is you take a message of any length. 
So on the left here, you see you've got a, a short message and a long message, and you put them through the hash function, and the output is going to be of a fixed length. So you can see here that even if the input is longer, the output is going to be the same length. So this is very nice um, it, because this allows you to shorten your public key into a short uh, address, essentially. And this address is what you're going to share with, with others. Uh, so you can see here it's kind of the process. You take the private key, you apply elliptic curve multiplication to it. Now you have a public key, you hash it, and you encode it, and then you have a, a Bitcoin address. So. Um, when, when you are sending a, uh, when you're sending a payment, when you want to send a payment, you need to ask the recipient to give you an address and you're going to send the Bitcoin to that address. Uh, conversely, if you, uh, if you want to, um, if you want to receive Bitcoin from someone else, you have to give them your address. So here are some of the common address formats uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, the oldest uh, format starts with a one, uh, and that's called P2PKH. Um, you, know, you don't necessarily need to, to remember these, uh, these acronyms because uh, your wallet software will handle this for you. It's just important to note that the BC1 addresses are actually uh, better in, in many ways, and um, from the encoding format, but also how they're using the blockchain. So uh, you generally want to favor uh, using the BC1 uh, format, which is the newest address format. So the nice thing about Bitcoin is that you can create as many private keys and as many addresses as you want without asking anyone for permission. Bitcoin is permissionless. So the reason that uh, I think it's important to highlight a property like permissionless is because when we're talking about the Bitcoin halving, uh, we tend to focus on the supply side of uh, Bitcoin, fewer Bitcoin getting created. And we'll cover that soon. But if we're trying to think about holistically, why is the halving important? Uh, the demand side is crucial as well. And permissionlessness is a key part of the demand side. Users do not need a license or franchise uh, to connect to the Bitcoin network. It is a free and open source protocol. Uh, on the left here is a BTC pay server point of sale checkout, uh, which you can self host on your own hardware or in the cloud. And on the right here is a mobile wallet that you can install for free and without depending on a third party. So being permissionless creates a level playing field and really it makes the easiest onboarding possible. So now, how do we uh, use this address? Uh, we use it using digital signatures. So digital signatures are for verifying the authenticity and integrity of digital messages. Uh, in this example, Bob wants to make sure that the message he received, hello Bob, um, really is from Alice. And so he's, he's got Alice's public key and he's going to use it to verify the message that Alice sent. In Bitcoin, the system is Bob, um, and the system is verifying that the sender, Alice, of Bitcoins actually has the private key needed to unlock the Bitcoins. So again, the, the address is a hash of the recipient's public key. The sender is going to lock up the Bitcoins to the address using uh, Bitcoin's scripting system, and the recipient uh, their private key can sign to unlock those Bitcoins after the fact. Um, and so you, you kind of see here that uh, to, to be able to send Bitcoin, you have to be able to unlock them. And then when you do send them, you, you lock them back up. So it's kind of an atomic process. So that's what a Bitcoin is. A Bitcoin is just a number. Um, and we're used to thinking about uh, the Bitcoin being the unit, right? But it's actually, if you look at the source code, uh, 100 million Satoshis is in one Bitcoin. And so you can have, in this case, 4 million Satoshis that are locked up by uh, a script. Now, a script can lock up any number of Bitcoin, 
as many or as few um, as, as you can. Um, and what you do with uh, the, the output then afterwards is that you provide an input that will unlock the output. And this input is going to have the signature in it, right? The signature of the spender uh, so that the system knows that the spender uh, actually does control the private key that is associated with that output. And so this is what maintains the integrity of the system so that uh, people cannot create more Bitcoin out of thin air uh, outside of the rules. And we're, we're gonna show, we're gonna see how the Bitcoin get created in the first place within the rules. Um, but after they've been created, uh, this, this process of lock, locking and unlocking Bitcoin uh, makes sure that throughout their history, the Bitcoin are not going to be um, falsified or counterfeited. And this is really important because otherwise, uh, Bitcoin's scarcity and the halving uh, would really be meaningless, right? So uh, this is kind of a way of cryptographically verifying that new Bitcoin are not being created. So what is a transaction? A Bitcoin transaction is a set of inputs that are unlocking the existing outputs and a set of new outputs that are being created uh, with new spending conditions. So new Bitcoin scripts uh, that are associated with addresses. Uh, you, you can reuse addresses. I, uh, it's, it's just generally a, a bad idea because it's bad for privacy to reuse addresses. So you're generally encouraged to generate a new address for uh, each output. And a transaction is identified by a unique hash of its data. So, um, you know, as, as we saw, you can, you can create a, a, a fixed length hash of any amount of data. And a transaction actually can have any amount of data um, because you can have one input and one output, or you might have uh, dozens of inputs and one output, or dozens of outputs and one input. But regardless of how much data is in the transaction, you can generate a transaction ID by applying a hash function to the transaction data and have it be of fixed length. And then you can take this transaction ID and you can actually uh, look it up on either a block explorer online using someone else's node, or you can look it up using your own node, which we're gonna cover. So here's an example of uh, spending an output. So you see here, there's an output that was already existing. We used, uh, it was locked to an address, A1, right? Which was associated with a private key. Um, and then we see here that Using private key A, uh, the sender provided a signature that unlocks that output, and then they locked up the Bitcoin in two new outputs. Uh, one is locked to uh, the, the recipient's address, B1, and the other output is locked to what's called a change address, A2. And uh, in Bitcoin, when you unlock an output, you have to spend it all. Um, and so if you don't spend it all, then what you don't spend will go to the miner, and we'll cover that very soon. So you want to make sure that it, either you're sending all of the Bitcoin to the intended recipient, or you have Bitcoin coming back to you in a change address. So this is a, a visual representation of the data inside of a transaction. And so you can see here that uh, the, the more uh, outputs and inputs you have, the more data is going to be used up by the transaction. I won't get into what each item is, um, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's important to highlight that uh, the Bitcoin system, you know, it, we'll, we'll see that its, it's main um, bottleneck is data. And so this is a way of uh, seeing that most of the data in Bitcoin is going to be used up by inputs and outputs. This brings us to the transaction fee. So if you add up all of the outputs that are being unlocked and you add up you know, what, what, how much Bitcoin they have, and then you subtract the 
if you subtract the uh, new outputs that are being created, this will give you a residual amount of uh, Bitcoin that is called the transaction fee. And this will go to the miner in what's called the Coinbase reward. So this is an illustration of that. So here you have, uh, you've got two inputs that add up to 0 0.8 Bitcoin, and you have two outputs that add up to 0 0.79 Bitcoin. And you have this little residual amount of 0 0.01 BTC that is not in any of the new outputs. What happens to it is that all of the transaction fees in the block uh, get added up and rolled up into this special transaction called the Coinbase transaction. And this Coinbase transaction has two parts to it. It's got the subsidy, which is actually a uh, new Bitcoin being created. Now, um, one point of view, which I uh, am very partial to, is that uh, new Bitcoin don't get created, they just get uh, discovered over time. And so they're, they're, they're being recognized by the system and um, parsed out to, to participants over time. Uh, and we'll, we'll see why that's a possible way of looking at it. Um, and so you have this subsidy, which is the, the new Bitcoins being created, and you have the fees. So that's the transaction fees that are getting summed up from all the transactions in a block. So this Coinbase transaction is created by a miner. Uh, it's very special because it doesn't have any inputs. And all, all of those coins are, are coming from, um, you know, out of nowhere, seemingly, uh, but as we saw. Um, now, the, you know, in, in terms of uh, when we're talking about the, the Bitcoin halving, uh, we're specifically talking about the subsidy. And so the subsidy here is going to be verified by the whole network to make sure that it is correct. There's a tremendous amount of scrutiny uh, put on it uh, so that we make sure that the miner's not creating more Bitcoin. And there's one, one, one coin-based transaction per, per block. Um, and the, the miner actually, that, that output, uh, the address that it's going to, would generally be controlled by the miner or the, the mining pool as it may be. And so um, that's how the miner is getting compensated for uh, the proof of work that they did. And we're, we're going to cover that as well. So uh, we talked about transactions. And um, when you create a Bitcoin transaction, you broadcast it to the network. And it goes into a backlog. So this is a queue, a backlog of transactions that um, are waiting to go into a block. And so a block is, is just a batch of transactions that have been put together by a miner. So when you're in this queue and you're waiting to enter a block, um, the, the miners are actually, and uh, you know, when you're thinking about where you are in this queue, you sort it by the transaction fee that you're paying. Now, it's not that you're sorting it by the total transaction fee that you're paying for your transaction. You're actually looking at the fee rate, which is how much fee are you paying per amount of data that your transaction is using. And so there's two big variables in this. One is what is the total transaction fee? And two, uh, what is the total size in bytes of you know, how much data is your transaction taking up. So that's going to depend on how many inputs and how many outputs you have. Um, and so the miners look at the fee rate, and whoever is paying the highest fee rate uh, will get into a block the fastest. You can go to this website, mempool.space, and you can see this visualization in real time. You'll be able to see uh, how many uh, transactions are getting into blocks and you'll be able to see the size of, of blocks and as well the, the fee rate for blocks wait, or for transactions waiting to get into blocks. Uh, so the reason that we have this backlog at all in, in uh, Bitcoin, now, um, you know, the, the backlog sometimes is, is empty, right? So uh, it, you're, you, you pay a very low fee rate 
and your transactions get into the next block very easily. Uh, sometimes the backlog is substantial. And so you might have to attach a very high fee rate if you want to get into the next block, or you attach a low fee rate and you have to wait a while for the backlog to clear out. So this is because Bitcoin has a block size limit. So this limit allows the, uh, and, and we'll see uh, the, the, how this affects the network, but um, essentially this limit sets an upper bound for the size, the, how much data uh, a Bitcoin block can have in it. And historically, um, you know, you can see here that in 2017, uh, we hit that limit of one megabyte. Uh, and then we had a protocol upgrade called SegWit, which now allows us to uh, go a little bit above uh, one megabyte and its usage of SegWit increases uh, will be able to increase uh, the amount of data um, as well. So you can see here, this is the, the volatility of, of the backlog. Um, the backlog became very large in September of 2017 and in January. Uh, and you can see in this chart that when the backlog was very big, the uh, Bitcoin transaction fees also went up very, very high. Uh, so here you can see that the average Bitcoin transaction fee uh, at the end of 2017 was $35. So this was obviously driven by the price mania that was going on at that point, and uh, people were uh, very excited to move their Bitcoin at any cost, and uh, they wanted to do it right then and there because the price was going parabolic. Uh, since then, we've seen um, a much less volatile uh, transaction fee market. Uh, so you can see here last year, uh, we, it went up to $5 uh, when, when the price was going up. Um, so there's a number of different reasons for why uh, transaction fees have been uh, much more muted since then. Uh, but generally, I think that it's because we learned a lot from 2017. And so people are learning to use the Bitcoin blockchain more efficiently. So uh, what is a block? Here's how, what a block looks like. Um, you've got the block header in yellow here that has uh, some information about uh, both, uh, it's got a hash of the previous block. Uh, we'll, we'll explain what that's used for. It's got a Merkle root, uh, which is actually kind of the, the sum of all of the Bitcoin transactions hashed in a tree. And we'll see how that works. It's a Merkle tree. We've got a timestamp here, which is approximately uh, when the block was, was um, found by the miner. And then we got the bits and the nonce. So let's explain how that works. So you may have heard about mining in the media. It's a, a hot topic. Um, and it's where uh, Bitcoin miners consume electricity to propose a block to the Bitcoin network. So uh, how miners do this is that they repeatedly hash their blocks data until they find a hash which is numerically less than the network difficulty called bits. So that's the bits part there. Um, there's a number of different ways of representing this. If uh, you know, Generally, like when you're comparing it, you would use uh, numbers, but this is in a different format. Um, and the way that the miners are able to uh, generate different hashes with the same data is that they change one little piece of it, the nonce. And so when every, every time they increment the nonce, uh, the entire hash changes, right? Because that's, that's just how a hash works. Um, and so you get the same fixed length output, uh, but the, uh, the hash changes, and that allows you to keep hashing until your block hash uh, is numerically less than the bits. So when the, when the miner finds a winning nonce, right, they've, they've incremented the nonce, and finally they found one that, that, that works, that generates a, a hash that's uh, small enough, uh, numerically, then they're going to be able to broadcast uh, that block to the network. And uh, then the, the nodes will be able to verify it. So mining is very costly, right? You're generating a lot of hashes. 
Uh, but verifying mining is actually very inexpensive because you just take the nonce and you take the header data, uh, you hash it, and you're able to reproduce the result that the miner had. So you then compare the hash to the bits, and um, it, it's a very straightforward operation. Uh, you can see here in the rest of the uh, block, you've got a transaction count. Um, so it says, you know, it's got 63 transactions. You've got the Coinbase transaction, and then a whole slew of the other transactions. Um, and we saw in, in the backlog here, typically you've got about 1,500 to 3,000 transactions in a block, um, depending on uh, the size of the transactions in it. Uh, and that's for blocks that are actually full and taking up as much data as they can. Okay, so um, th this is uh, this th this process here um, is what gives Bitcoin censorship resistance. And so the the proof of work mining is providing the transaction finality of Bitcoin, and censoring a transaction becomes a prisoner's dilemma as the uh, first miner to include the censored transaction will be able to collect the fee. And so in practice, Bitcoin transactions uh, have never been censored. Um, so this really is a significant uh, source of demand and interest for, for Bitcoin, uh, is the ability to send transactions and have them included in blocks and have them included uh, based on economics, right, based on the transaction fee paid, uh, and not have it be dependent on uh, permission from someone else or, uh, you know, on, on politics, right, uh, because we live in a highly, highly polarized political environment, both domestically uh, and internationally. And so you always have uh, political parties or activists on, on both sides, I'm, I'm not taking a political position here, um, on, on both sides trying to censor each other. And so, for example, here in the United States, uh, you know, there are people who want to legalize marijuana, who have uh, marijuana dispensaries, who believe in me medicinal marijuana. Um, you, you have them being censored by, uh, so they're, they're, they're not able to use the payment systems. And then on the, and so generally, you know, that's the kind of on the progressive side of things. And then on the conservative side of things here in the United States, you have gun stores uh, where their, their, their ability to access the financial system is also uh, under attack and being censored. And so um, we have this phenomenon where our payment systems, because the opportunity to politicize them exists, they do get politicized. Uh, in Bitcoin, you don't really have that opportunity uh, because Bitcoin is censorship resistant. And so uh, there's not really any interest in trying to figure out, okay, how do we kick people off of the Bitcoin network? Uh, and this leads me to one of the uh, interesting sayings in Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is for enemies, right? So people who, who don't like each other uh, can all use Bitcoin uh, because they can't uh, control Bitcoin or uh, f force others off the network. So here's a graph of Bitcoin's mining hash rate. Um, there's a few things that go into uh, why this hash rate has been increasing. Uh, you have the hardware technology, so ASICs. Uh, these are uh, specialized pieces of uh, computing hardware that are just for Bitcoin mining. Um, you also have miners finding uh, less and less expensive sources of electricity. Uh, so, for example, hydroelectric power is a lot less expensive uh, than um, you know other other sources of, of electricity, and so this this allows them to be able to mine at a higher hash rate. Uh, and then, of course, there's just the Bitcoin price going up. Right. So, the higher the price is, uh, the more electricity the more computational resources are going to be put towards uh, Bitcoin mining. So uh, what advantage does this give Bitcoin? Uh, this is called, um, so this is kind of a way of illustrating the relative transaction finality of Bitcoin. And this is a heuristic for figuring out how many days it takes to settle uh, $1 million uh, 
uh, worth of Bitcoin. Uh, you know, if you're sending $1 million worth of Bitcoin. Uh, so you, you can see here, Bitcoin's at the top here with uh, 0.04 days, a uh, very short amount of time. Um, and then uh, other systems have longer and longer uh, settlement periods. Uh, so if you're sending uh, large amounts of value, uh, this is very important to you. Um, and the, the reason this is important for all the other users as well, ultimately, is because the, uh, they're going to be doing business with uh, others who are sending large amounts of value, uh, whether it's an exchange um, or uh, they're actually using uh, Bitcoin in the, in the course of commerce. So yeah, with mining, you have uh, all of this mining hardware, but ultimately uh, it, it's not, um, it doesn't control the network. Uh, what miners do is that they propose new blocks to the network, and then it's really up to the network to accept or reject those blocks. And so the network is uh, Bitcoin nodes, um, thousands of them uh, run by anyone. You can, you can run a Bitcoin node on your cell phone even. Uh, but uh, most people run Bitcoin nodes on their uh, laptop or desktop computer or a server. And uh, these nodes, what, what they allow um, users to do is without having to trust anyone, you can verify that a payment being sent to you is actually going into a valid block. So it's, it's a valid transaction going into a valid block and then getting buried so it's, go, it's get, getting lots of proof of work done on it, and then other blocks are coming in. And so the, the, the payment you received uh, has finality to it. And so that's the advantage of running a node, is that you can verify the finality of the payment that you're you know, intending to receive. Um, and so at the same time, you're also verifying everyone else's transactions, uh, and you're verifying the Coinbase transaction, right? And so this, ultimately, this impenetrable fortress of validation is what's making sure that the amount of Bitcoin being introduced into circulation is strictly controlled. And uh, so anyone can run a, a, a node and uh, these, these nodes are receiving uh, the blocks from the, the miners and that's, that's what this infographic uh, um, illustrates. So I mentioned that uh, you wanna make sure that your transaction is being buried. Uh, here's how the burial happens. Uh, so um, each block has a hash of the previous block. Uh, and that's actually, that becomes part of the block's hash. Uh, and each block also has what's called a Merkle tree in it. And so the root of the Merkle tree is being included in the block. And then you can see here that, um, Ultimately, the Merkle tree is the sum of all of the transactions in the block. So if each transaction is being hashed into this root, what that means is that if you change one little piece of data inside of a transaction, then all of the hashes will change and the hash of the block will change. So this means that uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's ledger uh, is you're being fully verified by your node and thus its integrity is being verified and you can make sure that uh, you're, you're maintaining a, a, a certain level of, um, of unforgeable costliness, right? And so th this, this system is really why uh, Bitcoin can enforce the scarcity and why you're able to use a node to enforce the scarcity is because you're verifying everything cryptographically that is going into a block. And you also have a long list of rules inside of your node software. These are called consensus rules. And so for example, how many Bitcoin get created is a consensus rule that you're also verifying. Now, uh, when we're with each block, right, we're, we're adding up maybe a megabyte, maybe a little more, a little less. And so this, this is adding up to a lot of data. And so when you're spinning up a, a node, you have to download all of this data to be able to verify Bitcoin's entire history from day zero and make sure that no new Bitcoin um, were created in an unexpected manner, right? Uh, there's no 
uh, unexpected inflation going on in the system. So this is a, a huge cost. And um, it's not really as much of a problem in countries that have uh, very fast high-speed internet and uh, fiber optic internet. Um, but in, in other parts of the world, it's actually very onerous to have to download uh, 260 gigabytes of data. And in fact, in, in some parts of the world, it's simply impossible to do uh, at a residential internet connection because they might have data caps on it where you can only download X number of gigabytes per month. And so uh, it's very important if we want Bitcoin to be decentralized so that anyone can use the system in a trust minimized, in a trustless manner, um, then we want everyone to be able to run a full Bitcoin node. And so that's just where we, we get into the issue of how to scale Bitcoin. Uh, so we, we, we can't verify the monetary policy if we don't have resource usage limits uh, to, to keep the cost of full verification down. And so when we think about scaling, it's really about how do we use limited resources more efficiently um, so that we can uh, have more people using the Bitcoin system without degrading the assurances we have of the system uh, for the existing users and also for the new users for that matter. Um, you know, when, when you're joining the Bitcoin network, you want to have the same level of confidence in Bitcoin's monetary policy as someone who has been on the network for years. Uh, I think that's only fair. So the credibility of Bitcoin's monetary policy lies in your ability to independently verify the Bitcoin blockchain while enforcing the expected rules about inflation. Every node verifies that each block has the right proof of work, creating a, a cryptographic proof of unforgeable costliness. So running a Bitcoin node can be done on a, on a device as small as a Raspberry Pi, or as I mentioned, a cell phone. It's very inexpensive. Um, and so this process of downloading that 300 gigabytes um, that is called initial block download. And it's, it's the main bottleneck for Bitcoin scalability. Uh, after the node is caught up, it has independently and cryptographically verified Bitcoin's money supply. So to illustrate this, on, on July 10th last year, uh, a mining pool tried to create more Bitcoin than expected. So this inflationary block that they mined was marked invalid and rejected by everyone running a Bitcoin full node. And this incident really demonstrated the power of Bitcoin's independent monetary policy as enforced by the peer-to-peer -peer network. So here's the Bitcoin monetary policy. It has a fixed supply of 21 million, uh, and this is being dripped out with every block, so on average every 10 minutes. Um, and approximately every four years, the number of Bitcoins getting created in each block gets cut in half. This is the halving. So the total supply is asymptotically approaching 21 million Bitcoins. The first halving was in 2012. The second halving, so we started, at, uh, in, we started in 2009 at 50 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. In 2012, this was halved to 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes on average. Um, and then in 2016, this was halved again to 12 and a half Bitcoin every 10 minutes. And the third halving this year in a few, uh, is, is going to be going from 12 and a half to 6.25 Bitcoin. So the last fraction of the Bitcoin will be mined in, in 2140. But as you can see from this graph, almost all of the Bitcoin will have been mined by 2036. So uh, this is, uh, the, the halvings is, is one part of Bitcoin scarcity. Uh, the other part that we can enforce is what's called the difficulty adjustment. So when we were talking about mining, we mentioned that the miners are targeting a specific difficulty. And this difficulty is moved around by the Bitcoin nodes based on how fast blocks are coming in. So if blocks are coming in too quickly, that means that there's a lot of hash rate coming online. And so the difficulty will be adjusted upwards. 
So this allows us to throttle the block production so that we're always targeting an average of 10 minutes. If blocks are coming in too slowly, then we can actually uh, lower the difficulty. And so that will accelerate uh, block production back to 10 minutes uh, per block on average. Uh, so this difficulty adjustment, it's actually also um, making sure that the halvings happen on time, right? So without any difficulty adjustment, uh, all of the halvings would have happened on the first day of Bitcoin and all of, the, all of the Bitcoins would have been mined instantly and it would have been no fun. But the difficulty adjustment makes sure that the halvings happen every four years. And it, so it spaces out the distribution of new Bitcoin. So the third halving this year will be in nine weeks on May 11th on Monday uh, at 11, uh, so this is an approximate time, 11 GMT. Uh, the reason is that, uh, so it's an estimate for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the first reason is that blocks, while on average blocks come out every 10 minutes, um, that's only an average. So sometimes they come out more quickly, sometimes more slowly. Uh, it's an average over, over two weeks. So, um, you know, if, if, if we hit the average, which is highly unlikely, it'll be 1107 GMT. In all likelihood, it'll be uh, may, significantly before or after that, probably plus or minus a couple hours. Um, I'm sure that there's math that we could do uh, to, to kind of have a two standard deviation um, uh, estimate of it. Um, but if we're trying to be precise, uh, 1107. So set your alarm clocks. Uh, I'm sure that there will be parties uh, both in person and online. Uh, and so follow along uh, on Twitter uh, to, to see if you, there are, uh, you know, live streams and um, people doing virtual reality meetups uh, since we don't want to uh, be in a meeting in person in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I think that this will be an important milestone for us to celebrate. It's, to me, an illustration of really what makes Bitcoin interesting, which is that uh, this network is able to, in a decentralized manner, enforce the scarcity of the unit of, of Bitcoins. Here's the source code that's actually calculating uh, what the block subsidy, right, the, the creation of new Bitcoin uh, looks like. And so here we're just, we're, we're looking uh, to see what halving we're at uh, by looking up the, the subsidy halving interval. Um, and uh, then we, we can calculate, and if you know, if you know bitwise operators, uh, you're able to verify this source code uh, with your own eyes and then compile it uh, and then run it and you will know that Bitcoin's monetary policy is being correctly enforced. And uh, it really is just math. So uh, maybe an easier way to look at it is as uh, the stock to flow ratio. So the lower a stock to flow ratio, uh, the more abundant the production of a commodity is relative to uh, its above ground uh, existence, right? So, Oil, for example, has an extremely low stock to flow ratio. Uh, silver has a higher one. And then uh, Bitcoin in 2015, uh, before the second halving, uh, Bitcoin in 2020, uh, after the, the, the third halving, um, and then Bitcoin in 2025, in 2035. You see here that Bitcoin is getting closer and closer to gold's stock to flow ratio. And so, Bitcoin's hardness, its monetary soundness is actually improving over time. And another way of looking at it is uh, by, by these eras. And so uh, you can kind of see here, we got the, the price on a log chart uh, going through this, these different eras. And uh, so the first era that we'd mentioned was 50 Bitcoin, then in 25, 12 and a half. And then this new one that we're gonna be entering very soon is a 6.25 Bitcoin. And so this, this stock to flow, uh, so the, 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 uh, 
in the background here is kind of a, a, a smoothed out version of stock to flow. Um, and then overlaid on that is the price. And the reason that we're doing this on this graph is because a pseudonymous quant called plan B found that there is a statistically significant relationship between Bitcoin's stock to flow ratio and Bitcoin's market trading price. And this relationship has been independently verified by other quants. So we know he didn't make this up. Uh, and the likelihood that the relationship is caused by chance is close to zero. It has a very high R squared of uh, 0 0.9375. And on top of that, um, it's more likely than not that there is uh, not just correlation, but also co-integration between stock to flow and Bitcoin's market price, meaning that the correlation is highly unlikely to be spurious and there's likely to be a causal mechanism between Bitcoin's stock to flow and its price. Now, why would there be a causal mechanism? I, I think that we, we, we have a path for that uh, from the fundamentals that we just covered over the past hour, which is that uh, there's a tremendous amount of demand for Bitcoin uh, from you know, its, its censorship resistance, its seizure resistance, it's permissionless. And then there's also demand for Bitcoin because of its sound monetary policy that's being enforced by that decentralized network. And that sound monetary policy, the way we can quantify it is stock to flow, right? And so if we're able to quantify the sound monetary policy and compare it to Bitcoin's price, it, it does make sense that there would be a causal mechanism uh, between those two, um, e even, though, even though everyone knows about Bitcoin's future monetary policy or they hypothesize about it, ultimately it's going to be dependent on what actually happens, right? The actual Bitcoin that are being released into, this, into the wild uh, through the Coinbase transaction uh, and also the actual verification of Bitcoin's monetary policy, right? So we can't verify with our node future blocks. We can only verify not blocks as they come in. We're verifying the nonce as it comes in. And so it makes sense that we can't necessarily say with 100% certainty, you know, what Bitcoin's future is going to look like, but we can with 100% certainty say what Bitcoin's past looks like by using our Bitcoin full node. And so that's why I think that there's a causal mechanism uh, between the stock to flow and Bitcoin's price. There's always new information entering the market through our Bitcoin node. So this model forecasts here that uh, Bitcoin is going to hit $100,000 within the next six years. Now, as with any model, uh, this model could be wrong going forward, right? We know it's correct historically, but there's any number of reasons why the parameters for the model might destabilize in the future. And this forecast will turn out to be bunk. Uh, maybe that destabilization will happen because of coronavirus. Hopefully not, but we can't rule it out. So, uh, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't take this as financial advice. In fact, uh, take it with a very, very healthy uh, dose of skepticism, grain of salt. Um, and really, you want to you be thinking about this from a risk management perspective of what the range is, right? So you can see here uh, for, for Bitcoin's price for 2020, the range is from $10,000 to $100,000. So that's a very wide range. So, you know, if you're trading using leverage or uh, if you're betting your, you know, mortgage on Bitcoin, that's highly risky. And I'd strongly advise against it. Uh, now, obviously, your, your trading decisions are your own. Um, but I think that this forecast is helpful in terms of establishing uh, sort of some parameters for where, where the price is going to go. Uh, and then you'll want to update your views 
based on whether the model uh, continues to have this correlation and co-integration. Uh, and I, I, I'd highly recommend um, following Plan B on, on Twitter. Uh, he always has updates to, to what's going on with the model. Um, and it's also, it's interesting to note that uh, altcoins have no valuation model like this. Uh, in fact, altcoin prices are more correlated with Bitcoin's price than they are with their own stock to flow, which means that altcoins are correlated with Bitcoin's stock to flow, not with altcoin stock to flow. So that's really interesting. And I think it speaks to the, um, the causal mechanism that we discussed, right, of the credibility of the monetary policy. Uh, perhaps these altcoins just don't have that same level of established credibility. Perhaps in the future, they'll, they'll be able to gain that credibility. And then at that point, we'll start seeing um, the, the crypto markets uh, decorrelate in the sense that altcoins will start following their own path and stop following Bitcoin's path. But uh, we haven't seen that yet. So another uh, way of looking at uh, Bitcoin's price is the Sharpe ratio. Uh, so the Sharpe ratio shows uh, Bitcoin's returns um, and relative to its volatility. So we always hear from the media that Bitcoin is very volatile. And that is true. Bitcoin is very volatile. Uh, Bitcoin also has uh, very high returns. And these returns actually exceed the volatility over four years and outperforms any other asset. So if you look here, US stocks also have high returns and high volatility, uh, but they just don't have as good of a trade-off as Bitcoin does. So because of this, uh, there's, there's memes that have emerged uh, around uh, Bitcoin, and especially the HODL meme, right? Uh, this started out as a, a drunken posting on the internet, uh, and it, it turned into a, a common saying uh, in Bitcoin of, you know, you should just be buying and holding Bitcoin. So why, why is that? Um, you know, there's, there, this gets debated, right? Um, some people are for hodling, others are against it. So um, hodling is really just holding cash, right? Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer cash system. Uh, when you hold Bitcoin, you're holding cash uh, and you're doing what economists call saving. So there's a debate in economics with regards to holding cash savings. Uh, most, most mainstream economists subscribe to the view that uh, increases in savings create deflationary pressure, which causes high unemployment and economic contractions. Um, and so uh, they want to stimulate spending money on consumer or producer goods uh, to be able to reduce unemployment and stimulate economic growth. So they call this the paradox of thrift, that uh, while holding more cash uh, on a personal level is the responsible thing to do because you are preparing yourself for uncertain future cash flows, right? Um, and that uncertainty about uh, future cash outflows, that might be good in the sense that uh, we're talking about uh, whether we're going to have, um, you know, a great investment opportunity appear, or it can be bad, right? If there's a pandemic and you have to uh, uh, quarantine yourself, now you might lose your income. And so uh, future cash outflows might be good or bad, um, but in any case, they're uncertain. And so the, the way to hedge against them is to hold cash. So that's good on a personal level, uh, but uh, for the economy as a whole, According to mainstream economists, uh, it's bad. And so it's a paradox of thrift. Uh, so this paradox is used as a reason for inflation, for gradually decreasing the purchasing power of cash to disincentivize people from holding cash. Um, so this is, uh, so, so what ends up happening is for people to at least keep up with price inflation, they're encouraged to invest their money uh, with financial intermediaries uh, like uh, banks or the stock market um, so that the, their, their purchasing power uh, doesn't, doesn't drop. 
Now, that's, that's kind of the mainstream economist view. Um, the Austrian school of economics has the opposite view. Uh, they argue that holding cash benefits both the individual and the rest of the economy because it increases the purchasing power of everyone who is spending money on producer or consumer goods. So if others are saving, that actually benefits you if you are spending because now you have fewer people competing against you for the same producer or consumer goods. And so now it, you're, you've increased your purchasing power. Um, so with this view, disincentivizing holding cash only changes the timing of cash flows and benefits the issuers of the new currency, the commercial banks and the government. And that is called the Cantillon effect. So uh, pushing people into investing sooner rather than later uh, also has a negative quality on a uh, negative effect on the quality of investments. So just as increasing the poker blind in a poker game incentivizes you to play lower quality hands, uh, people settle for worse and worse investments uh, due to inflation until there's a financial crisis. So price deflation also puts employees uh, at a negotiating advantage uh, because uh, their, their real wages go up if the nominal wages stay the same. Uh, so we've seen that, that Bitcoin has rewarded savings with astronomical returns, uh, even when taking into account volatility. So we have a question here from an attendee. How is the increased scarcity of mined Bitcoin uh, connected to the increased hardness of uh, Bitcoin and stock to flow ratio? So is there an exponential increase in fiat price or purchasing power? So this is a good question. So um, when we uh, skip back here to uh, the model here, um, so the, the long term, it might seem like the um, model is implausible because it would, it would model an infinitely increasing price, right? As we reach the 21 million Bitcoin, the stock to flow ratio will go to be infinite. Um, and so one way to think about it maybe is that the price here is the US dollar price of Bitcoin. It's not the purchasing power of Bitcoin. And so if the value of Bitcoin, uh, or sorry, if, if, the, if the value of dollars goes to zero, then it would make sense for the price of Bitcoin in dollar terms to be infinite even if the purchasing power of Bitcoins uh, has a ceiling to it uh, based on the marginal propensity for Bitcoin holders to uh, invest or uh, consume. So that's a great question. Um, okay, so let's talk about the scarcity. So the, the 21 million Bitcoins is, is you know, the, the hard cap that we mentioned. And uh, we, at the beginning, uh, mentioned that there's 100 million Satoshis in one Bitcoin. There's 2.1 trillion Satoshis to go around. 2,100 trillion, 2.1 quadrillion. Um, Got to get your, your units right. That's a lot of Satoshis. Um, and yet, even if Bitcoins are scarce, can't people copy paste? the open source code and create their own altcoin? Yes, they can, and they do. There are thousands of altcoins. Some altcoins are just imitators of, of Bitcoin. Uh, others are really trying to innovate and, and do something new. Uh, they've got tremendous ambitions. So the, the, the crypto markets as a whole are not scarce, right? And much like art, crypto is not scarce. So, uh, the artwork on your ref refrigerator that is from your niece or nephew or son or grandson or granddaughter or daughter, or whatever the case may be, that artwork, it's going to be hard to put it on eBay and auction it off for any amount of money. Um, on the other hand, there's artwork that can be auctioned off for hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, this Leonardo da Vinci here recently sold for $450 million. So even if art is not scarce, specific pieces by specific artists are scarce. Why? Why is art abundant and yet 
used as an investment. It's differentiation that, that is really the key here. Um, differentiation is what drives real scarcity. Uh, so in the market for art, this is aesthetics and provenance. Uh, and then in the market for monies, um, for cryptocurrencies, uh, there are fundamental adoption drivers and reflexive feedback loops. So we actually already covered the fundamental adoption drivers of the past hour. Bitcoin is permissionless, it is seizure resistant, censorship resistant, and it has a credible sound monetary policy thanks to its decentralized network of nodes. So let's go into the uh, reflexive feedback loops. Um, so the first one is the first mover advantage. Uh, there were many attempts before Bitcoin to create electronic cash, uh, but Bitcoin was the first real success. This conferred on it several advantages. Uh, one is that as time passes, confidence in, in Bitcoin's future increases. Uh, Nassim Taleb popularized the phrase Lindy effect. Um, and it's an interesting heuristic to apply to Bitcoin. The longer Bitcoin is around, the more it can be considered robust and anti-fragile, more likely to continue to survive than new cryptocurrencies or uh, even new fiat currencies that, that haven't passed the test of time yet. Um, and this Lindy effect is, is really uh, highlighted by the halving, right? That we're on the third halving. And with, with each halving, our confidence in the next halving increases. So we've seen one halving, nothing bad happened. In fact, something very good happened. Bitcoin's purchasing power skyrocketed. With the second halving, nothing bad happened. In fact, Bitcoin's purchasing power skyrocketed again. So with the third halving, I think we can be pretty sure that nothing bad is going to happen. Uh, it's TBD what happens to Bitcoin's price. Now, uh, the, the other part of the halvings that ties into here is that the, the issuance of Bitcoins has been fair. Uh, Bitcoin's launch was announced on a public mailing list and Satoshi did not cheat with a pre-mine. Bitcoin's value started at zero. So we know Satoshi was mining at a loss from the beginning. Miners have had to spend electricity to acquire Bitcoins. Nobody got a sweetheart deal. And um, they're going to get hit by this halving, right? The, the minor revenue is going to get cut in half from the subsidy. And there's nothing they can do about that. There's nothing they can do about that because of the Bitcoin network. The nodes, if, if the miners try to ignore the halving, the nodes will mark that block as invalid and they will wait for a miner to propose a block that correctly follows the rules, that respects Bitcoin's monetary policy. Uh, and Bitcoin's ownership history is very long. And so there's been periods of redistribution from weak hands to strong hands through accumulation and distribution cycles. And you can actually see this uh, graphically. Uh, Unchained Capital put together what are called HODL waves. And so you're able to see, because of the public nature of the Bitcoin blockchain, you can see that there's uh, waves of people who uh, hold Bitcoin for a long time. And then when the price goes up, uh, some of them go out and, and move those Bitcoins to sell them. Um, now, there's noise in this as well, because people are moving Bitcoins for other reasons. Uh, and, and, but you can kind of see some general trends here and some big three waves. The other um, reflexive feedback loop is Bitcoin's brand. Bitcoin has the strongest brand of any cryptocurrency. Uh, in a 2019 poll across all age groups in the United States, 80 to 90% of people are familiar with the word Bitcoin. 40% uh, of Americans in the 18 to 34 age group are very or somewhat likely to buy Bitcoin within the next five years. It's a very powerful brand. Um, the rest of cryptocurrencies are rarely, if ever, specifically discussed in public. Uh, for example, when, when Trump tweeted about the topic, he, he said Bitcoin and then lumped the rest into a generic catch-all of cryptocurrencies. He did not mention XRP or Ethereum. 
Uh, this matches up with search data from Google over the past 12 months. Uh, Bitcoin has 10 to 20 times more search volume than Ethereum or XRP. So Bitcoin clearly has a, a much stronger brand at this point. Maybe that'll change in the future. We'll see. Uh, liquidity is the only utility of money. So the ability to convert it into another asset with as, as little slippage as possible. Um, and uh, liquidity can be thought of as how many people are willing to buy or sell and how much at what price. So that includes all of the limit orders at the exchanges, um, as well as the, the order books uh, that we each have in our head. And Bitcoin has more liquidity than any other cryptocurrency. It also has more volume and is listed on, and I should say more real volume. Uh, there, there, there's a problem of fake volume um, from some exchanges, not from Kraken. Um, and uh, Bitcoin is also listed on more exchanges than any other cryptocurrency. So the energy of, of consumption of, of Bitcoin mining is often, often brought up as a criticism. Uh, but I think digit, if, if you really apply some diligent analysis to it, uh, you can see that it's actually an advantage. Energy consumption is the fairest way to both distribute the Bitcoins, um, but also to provide transaction finality. Uh, all the other methods require centralized parties making political decisions. Without energy consumption, Bitcoin will really be the same as the status quo monetary system with central banks. Uh, as for the issue of pollution, uh, those are, pollution is caused by electricity production, not electricity consumption. So public policy questions about uh, pollution should center around how to regulate or tax electricity production, right? Whether it's coal plants, natural gas plants, uh, oil plants, uh, hydroelectricity, solar, nuclear power, all, all of these uh, ways of producing electricity, they're completely unrelated to Bitcoin. Bitcoin can use electricity from any source. It, it doesn't matter what source is generating that electricity for Bitcoin. Um, so fixating on CO2 emissions um, is completely fair from the point of view of the climate change crisis, but fundamentally it's unrelated to Bitcoin. Uh, forcing people to use less electricity is antithetical to liberal democracy and civilization. So, um, you know, if we're trying to force people to use less electricity, that necessarily requires a totalitarian electricity consumption surveillance state. So that's just not something that uh, we want to have uh, as a uh, society that uh, is trying to respect people's rights. Um, so in conclusion, uh, Bitcoin is scarce and differentiated. And ultimately, that's why the halving is interesting, is that we're going to have a supply shock in a system where demand is extremely robust. And so, uh, you know, we're, I'll leave it uh, to your imagination as to what this is going to do for, for Bitcoin's price uh, over the coming years. Uh, but um, personally, and this is not uh, the view of, of Kraken, my employer, um, you know, it's not, we don't have an official view on anything, uh, but uh, relating to price. Um, but my personal view uh, is that I'm bullish on Bitcoin. Uh, so um, if you want to tweet, uh, you can DM me on Twitter. My DMs are open. Uh, you can always ask me questions there. Um, you can also uh, ask me questions now. So I see here we have a question. Um, as for this halving, we have a chart from Plan B. Is not the halving already priced in then, thus invalidating his chart? Um, so for, for the uh, stock to flow to price uh, ratio, or uh, sorry, for the stock to flow to price uh, correlation, um, there's a number of different ways of visualizing the model. Um, so if you look at it, uh, using Plan B's chart, uh, you see that the halving actually, uh, you know, is, uh, happens at one point in time. And whereas the sh chart that I showed from Hamal 
actually has the having smoothed out. Um, and you know, there's there's a number of different ways of thinking about uh, why you should use one or the other. Um, ultimately, I think that Hamal's way of uh, presenting it visually is is more understandable because um, humans are very bad at looking at uh, uh, graphic visualizations and drawing conclusions from them quantitatively. You want to rely on statistics, right? Actually running the regression and actually running the co-integration tests um, rather than eyeballing it on a chart. If you eyeball it on a chart, you're gonna come to the wrong conclusions. In fact, if you eyeball it on a chart, you're gonna think that Bitcoin is correlated with time more than with uh, stock to flow, which is actually wrong. If you run uh, the quantitative modeling for it, uh, Bitcoin is not uh, co-integrated with time, uh, or it, it, it's, it's unlikely to be, um, based on, on the data we have available to us and the analysis that's been done. Uh, but it is uh, with, with uh, stock to flow, the price is, is uh, likely to be. So, um, I think that uh, you know, lo looking at Plan B's uh, uh, model is is fine as long as you understand uh, the quantitative support for it, and you're not relying on the uh, actual graph and eyeballing it and expecting the price to jump on the day of the halving. Right? I think that would be a, a huge analytical mistake. Would be to think that the Bitcoin price is going to uh, necessarily um, double or triple on the day of the halving. That, that doesn't make any sense because everyone already knows what day the halving is going to be, so they're already in position for it. Um, what, what does make sense is looking at stock to flow, not just the halving, right? Stock to flow is the halving uh, over time, right? And so uh, that actually uh, is, is more um, it's a, it gives you a better forecast historically for what the future price is going to be than just looking at time on its own or trying to use other variables for forecasting. So for example, the number of transactions or uh, astrological signs or who won the Super Bowl. Um, so in terms of finding a valuation model that is credible and defensible, uh, so far, uh, the only one we found is, is stock to flow. Uh, do, do we have any other questions today? Um, the person who asked the question uh, said, great answer. So I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to elaborate on that. Thank you for asking the question. Well, if there's no other questions today, uh, I will be doing this live webinar again on Friday or on Saturday. So if you missed it, uh, if you missed the beginning this time around, uh, tune in on Saturday. Uh, if you want to ask questions, uh, if, if you have some questions that come up in the meantime, uh, come back on Saturday as well. And thank you for your time today. Uh, this is my favorite topic to discuss is uh, Bitcoin's fundamentals and uh, its, its past and uh, you know, where, where, where I think it's going in the future. Uh, and uh, I look forward to talking with y'all again on Saturday.